So today we're going to talk about segmentation and colocalization. We're going to start out with a little bit of like broad overview to like analyzing biological images. Um, and the purpose of this is not necessarily to teach you how to analyze cochlear synapse data, um, although you'll be doing that this afternoon. So I hope you're able to do that too. Um, but I'm going to cover some extra stuff that might not be helpful this afternoon, just to kind of give you a broad overview of techniques that you can use for segmentation and colocalization. I won't go into all of them in depth, but hopefully it'll be like, I'll post these slides and you can look back at them later and you'll hopefully remember, oh, you know, there was a, there was a way to measure this thing or deal with this sort of error. Um, cool, so that's kind of broad overview of where we're going. So we've collected some images. Um, and when you publish a paper, hopefully you're not just gonna put in this image and say, I saw this thing. Um, you can include an image and it's really nice, but we really wanna quantify it. Um, so here I have synaptic distance, the distance between the pre and the post synaptic marker um, for a wild type and a knockout condition. And when we're doing our analysis, we're working left to right here. We're working from our data to try to get to a figure. Uh, when we're figuring out how to do our analysis, it's often helpful to kind of start in the reverse order. Um, like, I don't know if everyone did those like little mazes when you were a kid, but it was always easier to start at the end than to start at the beginning because you end up not taking all these rabbit trails and wasting time on them. Um, so in the same way, we can start with synaptic distance, and then we can start asking the big questions. What is a synapse in, our, in terms of our data? Um, a synapse is prayer, paired pre and post synaptic signals. So having one of each, um, and then you can kind of narrow down your definition a little bit and say, does the pairing need to be one-to-one? -one? If I have a CDBP2 signal, but I have two patches of glue R2, is that one synapse? Is that two synapse? Um, and that you can define these through a combination of going through the literature and figuring out um, what you think an appropriate definition is. But at some point, you just decide something, and you just got to clearly say how you defined it in your in your paper. Um, so once we figure out what a synapse is, we can also ask, what is a distance? Um, and so once you have these these two signals. Are you measuring the century to century distance? Are you measuring the surface to surface distance? Um, and again, you can think about this kind of in context of the biology, like what matters. Um, and then you can start to think about the interplay of synapses and distances and say, you know, if I have a CDBP2 puncta and I have a glue R2 puncta that's kind of far away, maybe that's still a synapse. But if it's this far away, that's definitely not a synapse. So we're going to have to draw some cutoffs of what we consider to be distance. Um, by the way, in the lab, I have you set up more counting synapses rather than doing distance. I'm kind of using this in, as an example, but you can kind of go through the same process to figure out how you're going to define your measurement. Um, so we now we have a definition. We want to calculate the surface to surface distance between the pre and the post synaptic signals. Um, and we can start filling in the gap of how we get from our image to that definition. Um, so you can take your image and take your two signals, segment your CDBP2 uh, signal, segment your glue R2 signal, uh, then identify one-to-one -one pairs according to our definition. We want one-to-one -one, um, based on which ones are closest to one another. Um, and then maybe as you're doing the analysis, you realize that it's really tricky to get surface measurements that are or like surface um, segmentation that's really accurate. And you might say, you know, biologically surface to surface distance probably matters more, but I can much more accurately measure the centroid to centroid distance. So you might end up making some, some modifications for the sake of measuring things more accurately. So that's, it's a little bit of an iterative process, but this is kind of how I think about and try to go through it. Um, 
So now that you have kind of like a rough outline of what you want to do, um, you're going to start trying lots of different ways to do it. Um, some of you probably have some really big files you took today of your Z stack, and maybe it was Airy scan. So you have like 32 detectors, then you can process it and it'll get smaller. Um, but you have your four colors, you have these really big images. And if you're trying lots of things on it, you're going to spend a lot of time sitting and waiting. So start with a little crop. Um, you could crop out just a few puncta, um, but you can't see it so much on there, but you can see here and you probably saw in your images. But the CDBP2 has like this nuclear signal. You probably want that to be in your crop because you want to know whether or not you're going to accidentally include that in your, um, in your segmentation. So try to choose something where you have a nice amount of background that's representative um, as well as your signal. Um, so then when we think about segmenting our signal, um, we're basically looking for bright objects on a dark background when we're talking about fluorescence. Um, and thinking about these images as data, that means they're high numbers in a sea of low numbers. Um, so the simplest thing we can do is we can just set a binary threshold where we select all pixels that are above a certain value and we call that our, um, our signal. Um, if you wanna look at the histogram uh, throughout, I'm gonna put in like a few notes of things, uh, little feed G commands. Um, so if you wanna look at the histogram for your image, you can press H and this will pop up. And this histogram is plotted with a linear axis so you'll see that over here in this yellow regime, there's really nothing there. Um, and that gives you kind of the idea that there is something there, but it's very small. Um, most of your image is background. And so you see kind of these three peaks over here, and those actually correspond to varying amounts of background. And we'll see that some of our thresholding algorithms will pick up on those. So if you adjust your contrast, um, you can start to see, you know, maybe one peak is this black background region here. One peak is kind of this medium background. Um, and you can also plot the log scale and you can start to see your signals way out here. So we're going to be looking to threshold somewhere around this midline. Um, to actually do your threshold, you can go to image adjust threshold or control shift T and you'll, this little dialog box will pop up. Um, and then you can adjust these sliders to adjust where your threshold is. So as you go from bright to dim, you'll see these puncta start to fill in more and more and fill out closer to the edges. You'll see the autofocus puncta start to fill in a little bit more. And then eventually you'll see the nuclei pop up and then you'll see the rest of the background kind of sweep in right to left. So the background's not, not totally even. You can go through and manually set a good threshold for each of your images, but it's gonna take a decent amount of time and it's gonna be a little biased potentially. Um, so we really wanna be able to set threshold values automatically if we can. Um, so you'll notice this little box here said default before, um, but you can drop it down and select a number of automated threshold methods. There's like mean, where it just takes the mean value of your whole image and puts the threshold there. There's the Atsu, there's Huang, there's all these things. Um, you can look up what each of them does to set the threshold for your image. Um, but you, it's gonna take, no matter how well you understand it, it's gonna take a little trial and error to figure out which one works best for your images. Um, so a nice little feature is you can go to the auto threshold and you can select one of these methods or you could say, try them all. And BG will output something that looks like this. And if you zoom in, it's kind of hard to see, but underneath each of them, it has the name of the threshold. So you can go back and use that one in the future. Uh, you can see a few of these thresholds are working. So maybe we could take the Atsu threshold and just move forward with that. Um, but you'll see a lot of them are picking up on nuclei. Um, and depending on how bright our nuclei are in our different images, maybe that's going to be more of a problem. So we can also do a bit of optimizing 
um, and uh, improve this thresholding. Any questions up to that point before I keep going? Cool. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so basically, sorry. Oh, yeah. Why, why are we even setting a threshold? Um, what we want to go, so we have an image. Yeah, let me back all the way up. Um, we have an image with different intensity values. And by eye, you can see there's some puncta in them. And you can start to, you could sit there and you can count where you think synapses are. Um, but if you want to automate or you want to use a more, um, yeah, like a more automated method, it's going to be a little bit less biased. You want to make something more high throughput. Um, you are going to want some way to identify where your signal is. Um, and so that's what we're using the threshold for. We're using it, we're going from our 8-bit or 16-bit, whatever bit image, to a binary background foreground. What are punk show? What is background? Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so we could start thinking about different sources of error that could affect our thresholding. Um, so here you can see there's non-specific staining, which leads to background of varying degrees. Um, probably notice that too in your glue R2 signal. Uh, there's some noise, which again varies depending on what microscope you're on. We've already talked about that a lot um, and what settings you chose. Uh, we have touching objects that make these little snowmen, um, which if they're touching, get counted as one object, one continuous thing instead of two objects. Um, and in addition to non-specific staining, you can have non-uniform staining. That's often more of a problem in something like DAPI, where you want to know where the whole nucleus is, but you kind of have patches of bright and dim staining. Um, so all of these sources of error, well, not all of them, but most of them you can address either in your initial image or in your mask. Um, most of them, it's often better to address in your original image if you can, because you have intensity information, you have a little bit higher dimensional information to work off of. Um, there are some cases where it's easier to do it in the mask, but I'll kind of talk through, I'll talk through both of those and you can, you can play around with a few different methods of doing, uh, fixing for these sources of error. So we've already noticed that we have some background in this image. And we have these nuclei. Um, so one thing that you can do is run a background subtraction. Um, the Fiji background subtraction runs a slightly more complex process than this, but essentially you can think of it as blurring your image and then subtracting that blurred image. So high frequency information, small things are gonna be retained and low frequency information or large things are gonna be subtracted out. Um, so when you run your background subtraction, you set a radius and you, I like to set it to the size of the largest structure I want to keep. So one of my bigger synapses is maybe about 10 pixels. And you can see that when you run it, um, you've gotten rid of a lot of the background. You've gotten rid of a lot of the staining in the nuclei. You're left with little puncta in the nuclei because you're left with kind of that high frequency information. Um, but you've evened out the background at least. Um, so depending on what your staining looks like, this could be good or bad because it might make it harder to get rid of your nuclei because now you have puncta if those are still really bright. Um, but in this case, it, it does help. Um, I didn't mean to go forward. One thing to note is that background subtraction is not just going to dim your background. It's also going to dim your signal. It's a subtraction across all your pixels. Um, and so if you have really limited dynamic range, you're imaging something really dim, you might start to notice that you're chopping into that. Um, for bright signals, it's probably not going to matter as much. Um, but you can test it. So here I drew a little box over one of my puncta before and after my background subtraction. Um, drew a little box, pressed M to measure. You could see the mean value is 33. Um, you can use Control-Shift-E to make the same box on another image. 
pressed M again, and you can see the mean in that punct has dropped down to 23. So I've lost about 30% of my signal. So just something to be wary of if you have really dim features to start with. Um, and then when I run my, oh, sorry, go ahead. So uh, this is more localized. So it's going to subtract more in your bright nuclei than it is in the other region. Um, I didn't include an image of it, but there's this little, there's a little checkbox where you can see a preview. So you can turn on that. And then you can also turn on create background instead of subtract, and it'll show you what it's subtracting. And so you can see it's going to subtract more in the nuclei than it is here. Um, whereas if you do math subtract, you're just subtracting a fixed number. So sometimes it's called like a baseline subtraction where you're just subtracting a fixed number. Uh, whereas this subtraction, each pixel is determined, not completely independently, but um, you're, is being subtracted by a different amount. Is that preserved in the area of the Yeah. Um, it is not necessarily going to maintain linearity in your intensity values depending on how your local background changes. Uh, some punks are gonna get more subtracted from than others. Um, and so it's mostly a tool for visualization or segmentation, yeah. Um, and it does improve the segmentation. So if we run our auto threshold, try all again, you can see that instead of a, like three or four of them doing well, three or four of them don't do well, and most of them are doing a pretty good job. Um, and you only need one of them to work. But again, if you're applying this to multiple images and you run a background subtraction first, you might get more robust thresholding across all of your images that have varying brightness um, or have like, yeah, varying brightness, varying background, et cetera. Um, the image we had wasn't very noisy, so I added more noise to it. Um, and you can see that if you're in this lower signal to noise regime, when you start trying to do your thresholding, there's no value that you can pick where you get the whole synaptic puncture and you don't have any holes in it and you still don't have background. Like you either have background or you don't have enough uh, of your synapse segmented. Um, so now we need to do something to get rid of this noise. Um, again, if you run, and this is, if you run uh, the auto threshold, you'll see there's a few options where you have a little bit of noise. There's one option where you have almost no segmentation and there's a lot of options where you have a lot of noise. Um, so there's a few different approaches that you can take to filtering. I like the median filter. It's what I would you'd start with, um, but I'll show you all three so that you can play around with them. And you'll notice the results will be pretty similar. Um, but basically in your median filter, for every pixel in your image, you look at all of the surrounding pixels. You end up with a three by three pixel grid. It's a three by three median filter. And you replace that pixel with the median of those nine pixels. So, you're blurring out a little bit of spatial information. Uh, you're like, if you had a hard edge, you're going to kind of maybe smooth it out a little bit. Um, more so with the median than with the mean, which we'll see next. Um, but if you have any outliers, these really high or these really low values from noise in your image, those are going to disappear. Mean filter is really similar, but instead of pulling the median, you're going to pull the mean. That's where you're really gonna start fuzzing over boundaries a little bit. Um, and, uh, but it should, on really big images, I think the mean filter should run faster than a median because it's just faster to calculate a mean. Um, but it's also three by three. Uh, the last you could do, you could also do run a Gaussian blur on there. Um, and I'll bring this back again later when we talk about uneven illumination or uneven staining. Um, but with the Gaussian, you can actually set a different radius um, value so you can blur more or less um, 
So here I just took my median filtered image, which is using the despeckle um, feature. And now again, you can see there are lots of different options that seem like they're working well for this image. Um, if we're talking about, this isn't DAPI, this is just CDBP2 that's staining a nucleus. So DAPI would look different, um, but uh, you can also use your Gaussian blurring and turn it up a little bit more with the caveat that you're gonna lose some spatial resolution. But if you wanna kind of just get rough boundaries of where your nuclei are, um, you can do a Gaussian blur to kind of smooth out these in inconsistencies. Um, and again, it's more obvious with DAPI where you have these different hetero and euchromatin regions that vary a lot. Um, so those are all methods that you can use to correct your image before you do your thresholding. Um, there's different things that you can also do after you do your thresholding. Um, so there are, there's like a 2D uh, process called analyze particles. The 3D version of that in Fiji is called 3D objects counter. Um, but when you launch it, it opens up this little window and you can see that there's two main parameters you can set, size and circularity. So you can set, um, here I set the minimum size to be 10 so that I throw out these little noisy uh, pixels. Uh, and I set the maximum value to be 100 so I throw out my nuclei. You'll notice I also threw out some of my bigger synapses so probably should have gone bigger. Um, but this is another way you can start cleaning up your, um, your masking. Uh, you can also change the circularity and say, get rid of round blobs. I'm only looking for long, not round things in my segmentation. Uh, also useful if you're looking at something like mitochondria and maybe you care more about the big, longer pieces and you don't care about little round ones. Um, Uh, once you have your image, there's a few different binary operations that you can also do on your thresholded image. Um, so again, I would recommend removing your noise beforehand, but for the sake of example, if you had your noise there, uh, the two like main binary operations, I don't know why this is so laggy, sorry, um, that you can do are erosion and dilation. So erosion pulls everything in by a pixel, erodes by a pixel, um, dilation adds a pixel to all of your boundaries in each direction. You can pair these. So you can do an opening, which is where you erode and then you dilate. So your erosion got rid of your noise and your dilation brings you back to the original size you had, more or less. Uh, you'll notice that the shapes are a little messed up, like this puncta kind of turned into a square. Um, you could do the opposite where you dilate and then erode. That's not gonna get rid of your noise, but if you had, um, like little holes in your image. It'll help close up the holes in your image. Um, and then you can start to do fancy things where if you have multiple masks, um, and we'll come back to this in the uh, co-localization portion, uh, that you can take the intersection uh, or the union of those uh, multiple masks. So here I have two signals, which I'm calling one and two. If you overlay them, you can see this, this little sliver of overlay in the middle. Um, and you can use this image calculator function to find out where uh, one and two are both positive, which is this little sliver. Uh, or you can find out where one or two is positive. So you get this double circle. Um, or you can find out where one and two are different from one another, which is the double circle, but missing the, the region of overlap. Um, so if you wanted to get fancy and you, you said, uh, you know, I have cells that are labeled with this color and this color, and I wanna find out what regions I have that are labeled for both, you could do that uh, using, using this and make a mask of that union. Um, and then we noticed that there were some touching objects. So the simplest way to split touching objects is using a watershed, uh, which is in that same binary operations menu. You can see for this doublet, it draws a nice straight line down the center. 
Um, and then for our two little sets of paired puncta, um, it clearly separates them. Um, one thing to note is this works in 2D. So if you have a 3D stack, it's not gonna put your separation necessarily in the same spot. So they might still get merged in 3D, um, but there are other plugins that don't come with VG, but you can install, um, which I'll post on Slack because I didn't actually, I don't think I put them in the, in the lab, um, but where it'll run the watershed in 3D. So you can clearly distinguish things in 3D. Um, like I said, with starting with a small crop, it's often helpful to also start with a single plane um, and move to 3D. Um, but if you make a small crop, you can also you can go ahead and start with 3D too. Okay, so we've done our background. We've addressed our noise. We've split touching objects. Um, if that's not good enough um, and you can't get good segmentation, no matter what you do, um, you can try a random forest learner. Um, this has, a lot of these have come online in the past few years. Um, most of them are the same. This uh, trainable Wika, Weka, just go with that. Uh, segmentation, I was waiting for someone to be like, actually it's, so, it's named after so-and-so and it's pronounced Wika. Um, segmentation is built into Fiji. So you should already have that installed. Um, lab kit is a really nice, uh, uh, Fiji one that you would have to install, but it has a little bit of a, um, more polished GUI. So it's maybe a little easier to work with. Um, and then elastic you might've heard of is really popular. Uh, the same kind of underlying structure lies under all of these. They all operate on the principle, uh, that, you know, you can do, you can add some sparse annotation. So here there's just a few little scribbles marking background and marking foreground. You could train your model based on that small number of pixels um, and then apply that model to the rest of your image or to many images. Um, and these do a pretty good job. Most, you can segment, if you can see a nice clean structure by eye, you could probably segment it using a random forest learner. Um, if that's still not good enough, um, you can, you know, code up a custom deep learning based network to segment your sample. Um, and it'll probably take you a long time unless you've been doing that for years. Um, or you can use, there's lots of existing ones that now are available in somewhat easy to install VG plugins. Um, so one popular one, sorry, Google Slides is, I've already clicked it twice, so I'm sure it's gonna go two slides in a moment. Uh, one popular one is Stardust, um, which is great for convex things like nuclei, uh, and it works in 2D and 3D. You can see it just does a great job of separating all these nuclei. You don't have to do any watershed afterwards. It's like, it takes care of all of it. Um, Deep Image J has, is like a repository of all these deep learning models that people can upload. Um, I just took a screenshot off their website. These were the first three that were on there. There are ones that are probably not segmentation as well, um, but people are making specific deep learning based models for bright field images, which are really hard to threshold with simple thresholds um, and all sorts of things. So there could be something useful in there that somebody has already done for you. Um, and then once you have your segmentation, if you're not doing co-localization, um, we, I showed particle analysis in the context of getting rid of things you don't want. Um, but if you enable display results, this could be the end of your pipeline. Um, so you can click okay and it'll give you out a table and it'll tell you for every single thing that's segmented in your image, what is the area? What is the circularity? Uh, what is the aspect ratio, the perimeter, all these things. Um, and you can enable uh, different, uh, like Federico showed yesterday where you could enable different measurements. You could do the same thing with this. Um, so in summary for segmentation, find an auto thresholder that works for your images um, so that you don't have to manually tune it for all of your images and definitely don't manually outline 
your images. Now that we have random forest learners, no one should ever have to do that. Um, and once you, uh, as you're going through that, you might find sources of error that you need to correct. And if none of that works, random forest. Any questions on segmentation before we talk about co-localization? Uh, I, I'm not sure what to, if segmentation is always required for co-localization. Um, the first thing I will talk about in the next part is the difference between object-based and maybe it's the second thing I talk about, but I will very shortly talk about ways that you can do co-localization without segmentation. Uh, segmentation is useful for some types of co-localization and then it's useful in and of itself if you want to pull out characteristics like the volume or the surface area of different structures. And I guess the problem I used to have now that I know all these good parameters to consider is that I didn't use them early on. Mm -hmm. But I was trying to train and the problem I'm having is uh, I, I guess you should do this noise, noise reduction things first and then the trains will be done. And like I guess a rough outline of the pipeline. Yeah. Um, I would say random forest learners are a little bit better at dealing with noise. You don't always have to remove it. Uh, because part of what they're doing in the background is they're learning, they do various levels of like blurring essentially, and they say, okay, you marked all these things as foreground, and the thing that you know I can kind of sort and say the foreground pixels were brighter than the background pixels, and even when you blurred them, they were still brighter than the background pixels, um, and so. Some of this pre-processing can help the random forest learners too, for sure. Um, but it tends to matter less. Basically, your random forest learners are looking at the three different things. So they're looking at the intensity, and they're looking at the merge image and blurred versions of the images. Blurred with different Gaussian blurs, with different UDI. Um, it's looking for edges. You can think of like a Gaussian, yeah, like a Gaussian filters. Um, and it's looking for texture using like testing filters. Um, and so sometimes that's kind of a helpful thing to think about when you're marking your images that like it's going to look for texture intensity and edges. And if there's like other more complex features that we need to be able to distinguish one thing from another, maybe that's a problem for you. Does that help at all? Um, all right, so then we can move to co-localization. So you have some images of pre and post synaptic signals or in general, your favorite protein X and your second favorite protein Y. Um, and you ask, is X co-localized with Y? Um, so now we're working backwards from a plot where we plotted co-localization. And the first question is what is what is co-localization? Um, so there's lots of different ways you can define this. There's no one definition. There's no one way to do co-localization. Um, so you can say, you know, what I really mean when I ask is X co-localized with Y is what percent of the X signal overlaps with the Y signal? Or the opposite, what percent of the Y signal overlaps with the X, which is not the same because they have different denominators. Um, what percent of my X objects are entirely inside of Y objects? What percent of my X objects are found near Y objects? Or, and this is where you don't need segmentation, is the intensity of Y positively correlated with the intensity of X? Um, and then there's different variations. These, this is not an exhaustive list. There's all sorts of ways you can ask these questions. Um, but then all of these have a spatial resolution associated with them. So if you wanna know, is X associated with Y and you look at it with a low mag objective, you're basically looking at it from very far away. If you look at it from outer space, like X is totally overlapping with Y. 
um, if you put it under your electron microscope and you're looking at it at the atomic mm -hmm. level, physics tells us that X cannot be overlapped with Y, that they have their own space. Um, and so you're operating somewhere in between those two extremes and you need to think about before you do your imaging, what is the scale that matters for my biology? Am I trying to say that these two proteins are bound to one another? Am I trying to say that this thing is inside of the nucleus? What is the length scale that my biology, that I care about as a biologist, and what is the length scale that I can competently talk about as a quantitative microscopist based on what I know about the resolution of my system? Um, okay, so these metrics can kind of be put in two buckets, object-based co-localization and intensity-based co-localization. Object-based is kind of, is X close to Y? Is X overlapping with Y? Things like that, where you're going to segment first and then you're going to measure how close together things are. Um, intensity-based co-localization doesn't require segmentation and you're asking whether the X intensity depends on the Y intensity. So you can measure that directly from your images. Um, so starting with object-based, we've got most of the way there because we've already got our segmentation. Um, if you wanna calculate the overlap of these things, you can just use the image calculator and use that AND function, the AND operation to find out where things overlap. Um, and then you can take a ratio of overlapped pixels to total pixels and say, 5% of my X signal overlaps with Y. Um, yeah. Yes, it's gonna take every single pixel of both images, even if they're 3D stacks and say, are either of these positive? Are they both positive? Um, and it will find regions where they are both, po both positive. So you can do it with a 3D stack. They just have to have the same dimensions. Yeah. Um, if you're, if you decide they don't need to be overlapping, but they need to be within 500 nanometers and my pixels are 250 nanometers. They have to be within two pixels of one another. Um, you could do something really simple where you do that dilation to expand by one pixel, do it again, um, and then do your and. And so that's what I'm kind of showing here. I've dilated my signal two. And then my overlap will become this larger region. Um, and so then I can say 20% of my X, my one signal, my signal one is within 500 nanometers of my signal two. Um, if you wanna get more complex and you wanna start to calculate pairwise distances and you wanna know exactly how far each surface is from each other surface or centroid to centroid, um, you can pull this into Python or MATLAB and write something up, or there's this nice little plugin um, that calculates surface to surface and centroid to centroid, uh, nearest neighbor distances, all these things from two masks that you have. So if you need something, these uh, more like measurements of distances, I would use Diana, um, which is distance analyzer, distance analysis. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you what? How do you get a final number out of this? Like you can make some images that overlap, but what what number do you get out? Um, it depends on how you defined your your question, of course. Um, but like one thing that you can do is um, if you have your um, your image of your overlap, and let's think in two D first. Um, you can use the measure tool and measure like the average of that image and compare that to the average of the other. I probably wouldn't do that. I think measure should also give you some, which will give you the total number of pixels that were positive times 255. 
because 255 is the value of these positive pixels. Um, you could use that particle analyzer. And what it's going to give you out is a table of all the regions of overlap it found and how big those are. So now you have a little bit more information instead of the whole image, you have information of these individual pieces. Um, if you need to do that in 3D, you could use the 3D version of the particle analyzer, um, or you can start getting creative about, I'm gonna take the sum of all of my slices together and then the sum of that and call that the total amount of positive pixels I had. Um, Particle analyzer is probably the easiest thing to start with. And the added benefit of that is it gives you additional information of for each overlap, how big it was and um, the shape characteristics would be kind of hard to pull. I don't know. I'd have a hard time thinking about how to pull useful information about that, but you'd at least get the size of each of those overlaps independently. And you can always add them together. Um, and you can run that also on your, so that's your numerator, like how much is overlapped. And you can run that on your, one of your signals uh, and that's your denominator. So how many green pixels did I segment and how much of them, how many of them were overlapping with red? Does that make sense? Cool. It's a long answer because you could do lots of things. Um, okay, so for intensity-based colocalization, um, we can think about the fact that every pixel, when you mouse over it, will give you the value, depending on which channel you have uh, turned on, in the red channel or in the green channel. And so here you can see like this pixel is 162 in the magenta channel and 203 in the green channel. Um, so I can plot this in kind of a 2D intensity space and say green is 203, magenta is 162, it's about there. And then I can do that for all of the pixels in my image. So now I have this 2D plot of all the pixels in my image and their green and magenta values. All of these intensity-based colocalization measures, I'm not gonna go into them in super depth, but basically most of them work off of this plot and say how correlated is magenta signal versus green signal. Um, if you had like a super straight line across the diagonal, then it's like you always have magent strong magenta signal. When you have strong green signal, you have strong co-localization. So one of the most commonly used um, ways of quantifying this is the Pearson's correlation coefficient, which is how well your points fit to a line. Um, so if you get a negative, coefficient, that means they're fit by a best fit by a negative line. If you get a positive coefficient, they're best fit by a positive line. Um, and then the extremes at one and negative one mean all of your points are on a line. And intermediate values, some fractional value like half, mean your points are generally following this line, but there's a lot of spread around it. Um, so this is often the first place that people start and where a lot of people stop with their colocalization measure. Um, it's super helpful to actually be able to plot your values and look at this plot right here. Because if you just calculate the Pearson coefficient and you get a value of 0.5, you have no idea what that means. Um, and so you could have something like this where X and Y are correlated, but there's some interesting stoichiometry going on in your biology and they're not linearly correlated. Um, and so your Pearson coefficient for these scatter plots might not be super high. And you can use something like Spearman's rank correlation coefficient, which doesn't ask how well do these things fit to align, but when X goes up, does Y go up? Are they monotonic? Um, so it's better at capturing these sort of nonlinear behaviors. Yeah. You mentioned that for the intensity base, we don't necessarily require segmentation. Mm -hmm. If you do segmentation, that introduces zero values. Does that go along with any of these questions? If you run it on a purely segmented image, you're going to have just like zero and 255. Um, and you could do that, but 
there's two different ways of running segmentation. One is making a pure segmentation zero and 255. The other way is segmenting out background and setting that to zero and keeping all of your values above that. Um, that's gonna keep a little bit more rich information of um, how your intensity varies across pixels. Um, and I totally forgot the other thing I was gonna say. Um, I don't know that I would recommend doing it on your binarized image, but there are benefits to doing it on an image where you set the background to zero um, because I'll show you in a couple of slides. If I don't come back to it, remind me. Or if I don't, yeah, really answer it. Um, man, I cannot recommend Google Slides. It like doesn't, there we go. Um, so a third really popular uh, measurement is the Manders overlap coefficients where you're basically summing up how much red intensity is located where I have green intensity. Um, and the like first definition of this is like, you call green intensity anywhere where you have non-zero green pixels. On your spinning disk images, all of your pixels are probably non-zero. Um, so what you uh, end up doing is usually setting a threshold, or what most people end up doing is setting a threshold and saying, Every green pixel value above 50 is positive, is green signal. And that's where I'm going to calculate wh whether or not I have red overlap. Um, and so circling back to your question, if you do that for both signals and you calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient, basically like, I can't do my mouse because it's too. You're only, I can't do it too. You're only going to segment this upper corner up here, or you're only going to put your line to that upper corner, and you're going to throw away all the values left of the line and all the values below the line. Um, and so your background in this region could be washing out your signal in terms of how well they're co localized. Um, and so that could be beneficial. I would try it both ways. I would look at the plot, I would see what's going on. Um, because yeah, you could justify it either way, especially if you have something like your synapses where you have all these background dots that are each gonna contribute to your, your linear fit. Yeah. Um, People definitely do it. That's how a Morris's co-localization tool works. It asks you to set zeros um, or like set thresholds. Um, there is a, there's like a, a way to determine how you can set those. That's called coats, I think, C-O-A-T-E-S. Um, and the um, co-localization tools that are built into Fiji uh, we'll also do that calculation for you. Um, so that's definitely something we're trying. It, like, it is a valid thing to do. I would, I haven't read any of those papers lately, but uh, there are, I would look at the Coates criteria, something to that effect. Um, just start thinking about that more deeply. Yeah. <laughs> it depends. And also, I don't know. In the math, you would only be doing this analysis on your ROI, not on the yeah, like places the, that will matter. Yeah, you know, in many cases, there's zero limit. You just need RE because it's just a thing to log in. But with all the filters and that's just going to block the whole stuff. But it's so easy to just work your way through the path of RE and avoid creating this bottom down gap. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
Code of two and you calculate the Pearson coefficient, does it throw out zero zeros or does it do those bias? That's what I was wondering. So if you're projecting the coefficient, it's not going to zero. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, hope, I, I believe in the justification, but I can't yeah. understand the explanation. No, I, now I kind of want to look at the formula and I'm like, do zeros even matter? I guess they reduce the variance in the data, yeah, so they might, know. but yeah. Sorry. Um, Here's how I think of it that it's kind of like a problem. One way to think about pipeline is that we think it could be a higher region in the image of the system, or it could be a little square within that region of the image that you're trying to do. What you can do with a fact is you could define something more sophisticated than a square. You can choose a model I regional interest that follows some contour or uh, is defined by something else in the sample so you're not drawing squares in that domain. You can use that mask to define the ROI to implement the closure that ROI. Am I missing something beyond that before? It, it just gets complicated when you're going into 3D because there's not like 3D ROIs in Fiji. And so it starts to matter whether, yeah, whether you have an ROI or whether you just masked out signal. But we can, we can dig into it further. And we have also lots of time this afternoon where you can try it both ways and see if it makes a difference. But, but perhaps one of the most important things that you might have long noticed by now is when you choose an ROI, just like when you choose a region of image for microscope, you're increasing volume. Over if you're aware that you're somehow Um, I had a slide at the beginning where I talked about that and I didn't realize that Google slide skipped over it until way too late, but basically, yeah, I was just going to bring up that point that the whole reason we want to use the auto thresholds and we want to automate our segmentation or our whole image analysis pipeline, whatever you're doing as much as possible is like, if your image analysis pipeline is I drew outlines around the cells and then you have somebody else do it, they're going to get different answers. If your image analysis pipeline is I run background subtraction with a radius size of 10, and then I do a despeckle, and then I use the Otsu threshold, then somebody else is going to get the exact same answer when they use your pipeline. Yeah. Um, so this might be more like progressive, it's the best practice. So set it up and we'll track of it. Yeah, so when you open, we can also, yeah, and we can look at this in more depth later, but uh, when you open Fiji, uh, you can search in the search bar for it, because I don't know where anything is in the menus, because I always just use the search bar. You can turn on the macro recorder, and it will keep track of everything you do. Um, so you'll see, like, if you change, turn a channel off, or you change a channel from red to magenta, it'll say like run magenta. It like basically makes a little macro code based on every click you do. So that's one good way to keep track of what you've done. Um, and then you'll need to parse out all the things that you did that didn't work that you want to throw away. Um, uh, but then you can make a little macro using those same little um, single line uh, like functions and apply them to all of your images um, like in batch or even one by one. Um, or you can just old school have a list of instructions and say, run this thing, run that thing. Uh, you introduce some human error, um, but it, if it's a simple pipeline, it could be more approachable to share with people and be like, hey, just click these two, just run these two functions in Fiji. 
Um, and it's nice that you can monitor kind of like what's going on at each step. So, um, you have to do a little bit of validation if you make a macro to know that it's actually working on all your images um, and that you can trust the numbers that come out. Yeah. Once you make your pipeline, run through it step by step on another image and see if it still looks good. So it works. Um, okay, so image J comes with Colook 2. Another popular one is Jacob. In the homework, there's a co-localization review that uses like screenshots and plots and references Jacob a lot. So if you, that review is super helpful. It's, it's long, but like very well written and goes through lots of things about co-localization, probably answers all of these questions better than I could. Um, and so it might be nice to use, you might wanna use that plugin if you like that review, because it kind of just follows along. Um, but they calculate a lot of the same numbers. Next slide. Um, sources of error. So we talked about this a little bit. You've got all this background down here. That's going to affect your like Pearson correlation coefficient. You can have bleed through, which often looks like highly correlated signal that is at a shallow slope one way or the other. So you can see here, um, as I increase my red signal, I have kind of this cluster of dots where I have linearly increasing green signal and it doesn't increase as much. It's not a X equals Y line because I have filters in place to try to block out my red light, um, but it's still there. Um, and so when you're setting kind of those backgrounds, maybe you're excluding those regions or you could do a fancy subtraction to kind of try to get rid of bleed through, but it's not going to be perfect. Um, basically, I'm giving you things to watch out for, and then you can do some Googling to figure out how to get rid of them, or you could talk to me, um, but I don't want to go super in depth on all them. Um, and then you can have chromatic shifts. Um, so here is an image of two different uh, signals, and this is in a cell. And these cells were imaged with some tetraspec beads sprinkled in. So what these arrows are pointing to are tetraspec beads that are in one location. They have not moved. They are the same bead in both channels and they are not located in the same spot. Um, and so you can do a correction. Now you can see these beads are nicely overlapped. You can see there's a couple other beads that are undergoing the same. And so now when you look at co-localization of these signals, you're actually comparing where is blue and where is orange more, much more accurately? Um, so briefly, um, the first thing in the lab walks through kind of using one plugin to align chromatic shifts. Um, again, what resolution do you care about for your co-localization? If you open up your beads and they look very nicely overlapped at the scale that you care about, then you probably don't have to do this. If you are doing storm and you're trying to measure the distance on like the nanometer scale between things, then you definitely have to do this. Um, so generally kind of the process is you get a map of beads, of bead positions um, in your two channels that you're gonna be co-localizing later. Um, and then you can create a map that shifts those channels so that they're aligned. So we went from kind of having this magenta channel with the green offset to having them nicely overlapped in the bottom image. You can take that mapping that you used and apply it to all of your other images. Um, and so in this case, you can see using that same mapping information, you can bring these two channels into alignment. Um, the unwarp J comes with image J, um, but I found that it doesn't seem to work on Mac. Um, so nano J core is pretty small. It should download pretty fast. And that's what I have the lab walk through. Um, and it's pretty straightforward to estimate your uh, 